today we are going to study an important theme or an important subject. And this is something that touches the law of God. And we will enter into this subject which uh, originated already in heaven. In Revelation chapter 12, we read verse 7 onwards. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceived the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And verse 12. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. In heaven there was a war, the Bible tells us, between Michael and and the dragon. In other words, between Jesus Christ and Lucifer, there was a war. And it, in the end, there was no place for Lucifer in heaven. He was cast out. The dragon is called here, or the old serpent, the devil, and Satan. But what was that war all about? We read in the book, The Great Controversy, Great Controversy on page 499. Great Controversy 499. To the very close of the controversy in heaven, the great usurper continued to justify himself. When it was announced that with all his sympathizers he must be expelled from the abodes of bliss, then the rebel leader boldly avowed his contempt for the Creator's law. He reiterated his claim that angels needed no control, but should be left to follow their own will, which would ever guide them right. He denounced the divine statutes as a restriction of their liberty and declared that it was his purpose to secure the abolition of law, that freed from this restraint, the host of heaven might enter upon a more exalted, more glorious state of existence. The dragon... Satan in heaven began his work of attacking God's law. And he intended to abolish the law. And he said that doing this, the angels were, will reach a more exalted, more glorious state of existence. And he said that angels do not need law. And Satan's hatred from that time until today is against God's holy law. And if he could take people 
to transgress God's law, he is sure that he will have them on his side. But that struggle, that war that began in heaven, had to come to an end there. And the devil was cast out, the Bible tells us. But we have read also in Revelation chapter 12, verse 12, the middle part of verse 12, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth, for the devil is come down unto you. That same work that he began in heaven, he continued here on earth. And he succeeded to some extent with our first parents to transgress God's law. And right in the family of our first parent, after they committed sin, it was manifest a great transgression of the sixth commandment of God's law. And that is, thou shalt not kill. In the same family of Adam was revealed the character of Satan. Cain, angry against his brother, because his brother's works were righteous, he killed his brother. Satan led, right in the beginning, man to transgress God's law. And from that time onwards, we read that the imagination of the thought of man was evil continually. And the spirit of prophecy tells us that the antediluvians, they delighted to take lives of animals, eating their flesh, and made them more bloodthirsty. It also tells us that they considered human life with astonishing indifference. And this happened because Satan was cast out of heaven and he found a place here on earth. And the Bible says, Woe to them that are on earth that inhabit the earth because this great enemy of God and his law came down to this earth. In the Old Testament times, we find on many occasions that there were wars, not only in the family, among relatives, among neighbors, but also among nations. Let's just look in the time of the people of Israel. In the time of the children of Israel, God used many times other nations to punish the Israelites. Israel was not only a chosen people, but Israel was also a nation. And sometimes God had chosen the Israelites to punish other nations. But when God asked the people to go against the enemy, God did not intend that they should bear arms. A few statements from the Bible make this very clear. 
Exodus chapter 14, Exodus 14, verses 13 and 14, we read, And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. Whenever God promised the children of Israel or his people that they should go against the enemy, the Lord always promised, I will fight for you. They did not need to fight. In Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 18, 28 to 30, we read, Whither shall we go up? Our brethren have discouraged our hearts, saying, The people is greater and taller than we. The cities are great and walled up to heaven. And moreover, we have seen the sons of the Anakims there. Then I said unto you, Dread not, neither be afraid of them. The Lord your God, which goeth before you, he shall fight for you, according to all that he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. In this promise that Moses repeated to the children of Israel, again we find the Lord was going to fight for them. They should not be afraid to face the enemy because the Lord would fight for them. And as we mentioned before, God did not intend that they should use weapons and should transgress God's law. The Lord will, would defeat the enemy. And also in Deuteronomy chapter 20, verses 2 to 4, we read, And it shall be, when ye are come nigh unto the battle, that the priest shall approach and speak unto the people, and shall say unto them, Hear, O Israel, ye approach this day unto battle against your enemies. Let not your hearts faint, fear not, and do not tremble. Neither be ye terrified because of them. For the Lord your God is he that goeth with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. Again here is repeated the same promise that the Lord will go with them, will protect them, will save them, and he will destroy the enemies. God would do the work of destruction, but he never intended that any of his children should transgress his law. There were occasions when the children of Israel won great battles. And let's look to some of these occasions. What weapons did they use to defeat the enemy? For example, in Judges chapter 7, verses 19 to 21. So Gideon and the hundred men that were with him came unto the outside of the camp in the beginning of the middle watch. And they had but newly set the watch. And they blew the trumpets and break the pitchers that were in their hands. And three companies blew the trumpets and break the pitchers and held the lamps in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands to blow withal. And they cried 
the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And they stood every man in his place round about the camp, and all the host ran and cried and fled. Here there was a wonderful deliverance of the children of Israel under the leadership of Gideon. And what was the weapons that they used? The Bible says clearly that they had no other weapons, but they had only trumpets and pitchers. And they blew the trumpets, they broke the pitchers, and the enemy was defeated. On another occasion, we read in Second Chronicles chapter 20, verses 21 to 23. Second Chronicles 20, 21 to 23. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord, and that should praise the beauty of holiness, as they went out before the army, and to say, Praise the Lord, for his mercy endureth forever. And when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, which were come against Judah. And they were smitten, for the children of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, utterly to slay and destroy them. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, everyone helped to destroy one another. In this wonderful deliverance of the children of Israel in the time of King Jehoshaphat, the instruments used in this war were singers. They were singing, praising the name of the Lord. They praised the name of the Lord for His mercy endures forever. And when they were praising the Lord, the enemies, they destroyed themselves. The Moabites and Ammonites, they went against the inhabitants of Seir, and they put embushment against uh, the children of Moab, and they were completely defeated. And each of them, they helped to destroy the other. So we find examples in the time of Israel, when there were wars, they used a choir, they used singers to praise the name of the Lord, they used trumpets, they used pitchers, and the enemy was defeated. And when they had to go to war. And the Lord said, go against them. It was God's intention that they should be quiet and trust in the Lord. And the Lord would fight for them to deliver them from the hands of the enemy. But many times, because of disobedience, to God. They endeavored also to fight like other nations. And many times Israel was defeated. In the Bible, we read in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, the words of Jesus. Matthew, chapter 5, verses 43 and 44. Ye have heard that it has been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, and do good to them that hate you, and pray for them 
which despitefully use you and persecute you. In the old times, Jesus said, you heard what was said, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, as is mentioned here in verse 38. And in verse 43, it was told of old, you shall love your neighbor but hate your enemy. But under the kingdom of grace that Jesus came to establish, Jesus explained that we should not hate anyone. We should love the neighbors, but we should love also our enemies. He said, do good to them that hate you. If we want to fulfill this injunction of Jesus to love our enemies, certainly we cannot take their lives. And in the time of Jesus, when he was on his trial before Pilate, Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom would be of this world, I, my disciples would fight for me. And certainly they would win. But my kingdom is not of this world. And when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, when Peter drew on his sword and he stroked the ear of the servant of the high priest, what did Jesus say to Peter? Peter, put up your sword, because he that kills with the sword, with the sword must be killed. Put up your sword. It was not God's will that his people should ever take part in war. And this truth was understood clearly by the early Seventh-day Adventists. I want to read a statement made by the Seventh-day Adventist Church when they were facing the great problem of the civil war in the United States. On August 3rd, 1864, this is what the Seventh-day Adventist Church recorded, and this is also it transcribed from this book, Seventh-day Adventists in Time of War. This book was written by Francis McLellan Wilcox, Seventh-day Adventists in Time of War. Now, on page 58 of this book, this is what we read. We the undersigned executive committee of the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists respectfully beg leave to present for your consideration the following statements. The denomination of Christians calling themselves Seventh-day Adventists, taking the Bible as their rule of faith and practice, are unanimous in their views that its teachings are contrary to the spirit and practice of war. Hence, they have ever been conscientiously opposed to bearing arms. If there is any portion of the Bible which we, as a people, can point to more than another as our creed, it is the law of the Ten Commandments, which we regard as the supreme law, and each precept of which 
we take in its most obvious and literal import. The fourth of these commandments requires cessation from labor on the seventh day of the week. The sixth prohibits the taking of life, neither of which, in our view, could be observed while doing military duty. Our practice has uniformly been consistent with these principles. Hence, our people have not felt free to enlist into the service. In none of our denominational publications have we advocated or encouraged the practice of bearing arms. And when drafted, rather than violate our principles, we have been content to pay and assist each other in paying the 300 commutation money. And while that provision remained of universal application, we did not deem any public expression of our sentiments on this question called for. In this statement, there are two important points that the Adventists mention. These two important points is the fourth and the sixth commandments. Neither of these could be kept in the war. Previous to that, when the Seventh-day Adventists, they associated themselves as a church, they made a solemn declaration. And this is taken from the book, The Story of the Advent Movement, page 105. They made this declaration in 1861. We, the undersigned, hereby associate ourselves together as a church, taking the name of Seventh-day Adventists, covenanting to keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. They made a solemn covenant to keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus when they organized themselves as a church. In that time, in 1860 onwards, especially in the time when they made the declaration in 64, there was a provision in the law that those who conscientiously did not want to take part in the war, they could pay $300. Now remember, in that time, at that time, $300 was a huge amount of money. But they, rather than transgress God's law, they were prepared to do that. Even helping those that they wanted to be free from the military service. In the uh, explanation of the editors of Ellen White's testimonies, in volume 1, in the appendix, page 716, this is the explanation that is given. As there was no provision made for assigning Seventh-day Adventists to non-combatant service, and no allowance for Sabbath observance, Sabbath keepers were drafted usually in this way purchase their exemption. If the individual was unable to raise the money himself, he was helped by a fund raised for that purpose. So when many military age were drafted, rather than transgress God's law, they purchased their exemption, which was lawful and legal by paying the $300 commutation money. And this money was raised 
by others to help one that decided to keep faithful to the law of God. In a book published by the Seventh-day Adventist Church that is used in the seminaries called The Story of Our Church, in that book on page 496, this is the explanation that they give. Up to July 1864, the exemption was available to all, but after that date, only the conscientious objectors could claim it. The church leaders at once sought and obtained a ruling from the provost marshal in Washington, D.C., instructing all deputy marshals that all Seventh-day Adventist men should be considered non-combatants. Most Adventists claimed the exemption and were aided in paying the fee by liberal gifts from the church membership. Those who entered the armed services were rarely given non-combatant privileges. The officers either had not read or chose to ignore the directions from Washington. Notice carefully that up to July 1864, there was no exemption available. But only to conscientious objectors could claim. The Seventh-day Adventists, they adopted the position of non-combatants which at that time meant no participation in war, according to their declaration that in the war, two commandments cannot be kept. This was their position. And they kept this position of non-combatants up to this day. But exemption was granted from the war service only to the conscientious objectors, which they did not adopt. They adopted non-combatancy. Now what is the duty of the non-combatants? I want to read from the same book, Seventh-day Adventist in Time of War, page 389. Seventh-day Adventist in Time of War, page 389. This is what they explain, what is the duty of a non-combatant. A non-combatant may render service in many lines of activity. We call attention to the following lines, medical, nursing, cooking, first aid, dental, embalming, band music, accounting, secretarial, printing, electrical, mechanical, carpentry, surveying, tailoring, shoe repairing, etc. Now all these can be done by non-combatants. Some of them are all right, but let's take for instance a cook, which is a non-combatant. On the Sabbath he has to prepare the food for the army. Can he say especially in time of war, can he say, oh, I'm sorry, today I cannot cook the food because today is Sabbath. I have to have my day of rest. Can he say that? Or let's take the electrical repair. Suppose that some equipment needs attention 
or even installation, electrical installation somewhere, urgently, and it's a Sabbath day. Can this electrician say, oh, I will do it tomorrow, not today? Or take a mechanic, for example. The truck broke down, needs repairing. And can he say, oh, not today. Today is Sabbath. I cannot do it. I'll do it tomorrow. Such excuses are unacceptable in times of war. Therefore, as non-combatants, we have nothing to do in the war, even as non-combatants. Our position should be conscientious objectors, because we know that war enterprise is not a God's enterprise. In uh, Great Controversy, page 589, we read the following. Great Controversy, page 589. Through spiritualism, Satan appears as a benefactor of the race, healing the diseases of the people and professing to present a new and more exalted system of religious faith. But at the same time, he works as a destroyer. His temptations are leading multitudes to ruin. Intemperance dethrones reason. Sensual indulgence, strife, and bloodshed follow. Satan delights in war for it excites the worst passions of the soul and then sweeps into eternity its victims steeped in vice and blood. It is his object to incite the nations to war against one another, for he can thus divert the minds of the people from the work of preparation to stand in the day of God. War enterprise is a delight of Satan and he associates war with spiritualism and in the end he is a destroyer. He, dis he delights in exciting the nations one against the other. And with this is his object to deviate or lead astray the minds of God's people from the work that they have to do and also from their preparation for the day of God. Wars and rumors of wars would exist in a time of the end especially. Jesus had foretold that. And Testimonies for the Church, Volume 9, page 17, we read, Fearful tests and trials await the people of God. The spirit of war is turning the nations from one end of the earth to the other, but in the midst of the time of trouble that is coming, a time of trouble such as has not been since there was a nation, God's chosen people will stand unmoved. Satan and his host cannot destroy them, for angels that excel in strength will protect them. The nations they are stirred with the spirit of war from one end to the other of the earth. 
and fearful test await God's people. Soon, grievous troubles will arise among the nations. Troubles that will not cease until Jesus comes. The judgments of God are in the land. The wars and rumors of wars, the destruction by fire and flood, say clearly that the time of trouble, which is to increase until the end, is very near at hand. We have no time to lose. The world is stirred with the spirit of war. Yes, wars and rumors of wars will increase more and more until will culminate in the final conflagration, the war of the Armageddon. And I want to read a statement from the Spirit of Prophecy, Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 967. Seventh day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 967. Four mighty angels hold back the powers of this earth till the servants of God are sealed in their foreheads. The nations of the world are eager for conflict, but they are held in check by the angels. When this restraining power is removed, there will come a time of trouble and anguish. Deadly instruments of warfare will be invented. Vessels with their living cargo will be entombed in the great deep. All who have not the spirit of truth will unite under the leadership of satanic agencies. But they, the nations, are to be kept under control till the time shall come for the great battle of Armageddon. These deadly instruments invented will be kept in check until that final conflagration, the battle of Armageddon. When the people of God face the war question in the United States, during the Civil War, then a decision had to be made whether they should or should not take part in the war. Aided by the spirit of prophecy, this is what was declared in Testaments for the Church, Volume 1, 361. I was shown that God's people, who are his peculiar treasure, cannot engage in this perplexing war, for it is opposed to every principle of their faith. In the army, they cannot obey the truth, and at the same time obey the requirements of their officers there would be a continual violation of conscience. Worldly men are governed by worldly principles. They can appreciate no other. Worldly policy and public opinion comprise the principle of action that governs them and leads them to practice the form of right doing. But God's people cannot be governed by these motives. The words and commands of God written in the soul are spirit and life and there is power in them to bring into subjection and enforce obedience. The ten precepts of Jehovah are the foundation of all righteous and good laws. Those who love God's commandments will conform to every good law of the land, but if the requirements of the rulers are such as conflict with the laws of God, the only question to be settled is, shall we obey God or man? 
In this statement, it was clearly pointed out that God's people cannot be engaged in the war. Of course, this testimony was, was in reference to the civil war because it was very perplexing. But the question is to be asked, which war is not perplexing? If God's people could not take part in that war because it was perplexing, God's people cannot take part in other wars either because they are also perplexing. Besides that, the spirit of prophecy says that this taking part in the war is opposed to every principle of their faith. Every principle of their faith. And in the army, they cannot obey the truth and at the same time obey the requirements of their officers. Brethren, it was not only the Seventh-day Adventist Church that understood that war enterprise is satanic and it is breaking the law of God. I want to read to you some statements from other churches besides Seventh-day Adventists. And this is also recorded in the book, Seventh-day Adventists in Time of War, page 402 onwards. And I want to read to you what the Congregational Church, they made a resolution, and I'll read their resolution. Resolved that the cleavage between the way of Jesus and the system of war is clear. We of this council are convinced that we must now make this declaration. The church is through with war. We of this council call upon the people of our churches to renounce war and all its works and ways and to refuse to support, sanction or bless it. The mind of our church in so far as this vote reveals it, has moved to this solemn conviction. This was published in 1934, June 27, and was published by the Congregational Church. I want to read to you now what the Methodist Church says about the war. This was published in the Christian Advocate, May 31, 1934. They say, our fundamental conviction is that war is sin. Very plain statement, isn't it? War is sin. This is the logical conclusion which follow the pronouncements of the General Conference but its full import does not yet possess the mind of the church at large. Now remember, these are declarations of the Methodist Church, Methodist Episcopal Church. We believe that war is sin because it involves A, the slaughter of human beings, B, violation of personality, C, lying propaganda, D, deliberate breeding of the spirit of hate, E, vast destruction of property, F, it puts in the place of moral law the doctrine of military necessity, G, it distorts the religion of Jesus into the religion of a war god. You see, this was the declaration of the Methodist Episcopal Church. Now, the Protestant Episcopal Church says, We are bound by every solemn obligation 
to wage unremitting war against war. Love of country must be qualified by love of all mankind. Patriotism is subordinate to religion. The cross is above the flag. In any issue between country and God, the clear duty of the Christian is to put obedience to God above every other loyalty. No nation can live unto itself. We must cooperate or perish. War will be abolished finally only when Christ's spirit is of forgiveness and reconciliation is in control of the world's international relations. And now the declaration of the Reformed Presbyterian Church. And this is just two statements, short statement. War is essentially and inherently a supreme violation of the teachings and spirit of Jesus. As a method for securing national ends, however just and right, is anti-Christian. This is the declaration of the Reformed Presbyterian Church. Synod, 1924. The Universalist Church. They declared, war is a denial of the basic principles of the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, a violation of the Christian religion. The Seventh-day Baptist Church declares this, war is unchristian. We have glorified war and made warriors our heroes. Up to the present time we have worshipped military force. The time is here when we must decide which of these traditions shall prevail, whether the cross or the sword shall be our symbol, whether we will worship Christ or Mars, for both cannot prevail together. Seventh-day Baptist General Conference, decision in 1931. United Brethren Church, they declared, we believe that war is contrary to the spirit of Christ and the gospel and love and brotherhood which we profess. It violates the Christian ideal of mercy, justice, truthfulness, self-control, virtue and righteousness. Christ taught men to love trust, forgive, and help one another. The church should never allow herself to be used to prepare for war or make war, but rather to promote peace, foster love, and eliminate suspicion and fear, while we recognize the rightful authority of civil government and the important place it occupies in the present order of society, Yet, it is the conviction of many Christians that it is inconsistent for them as followers of Christ to participate in or sanction war as a means of settling international dispute or controversies. This is Church of the Brethren in Christ their general conference in 1933. They made their decision. Now the Presbyterian Church, just one short paragraph, I read, Christians cannot give their support to war as a method of carrying on international conflict. This is minutes of the Presbyterian General Assembly, May 28, 1934. We have seen many Christian churches, they took their stand against the war service because it is opposing the principles of Christianity according to what they themselves 
have uh, declared. But the uh, participation in the war is a violation of every principle of faith, especially of those who claim to believe in the validity of the Ten Commandments. The uh, war service is a complete rejection of the Ten Commandments. We could analyze commandment by commandment. The first commandment says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. In Patriarchs and Prophets, on page 305, I read this declaration commanding the first commandment. Man is forbidden to give to any other object the first place in his affections or his service. Whatever we cherish that tends to lessen our love for God or to interfere with the service due him, of that do we make a God. And in Testimonies for the Church, page 249 of volume 8, we read, The powers from beneath are stirred with deep intensity. War and bloodshed are the result. The moral atmosphere is poisoned with cruel, horrible doings. The spirit of strife is spreading. It abounds in every place. The first commandment says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And speaking about engaging in the civil war, the servant of the Lord says in volume 1, Testimonies for the Church, page 363 and 364, very many men in authority, generals and officers, act in conformity with the instructions communicated by spirits. The spirits of devils, professing to be the dead warriors and skillful generals, communicate with men in authority and control many of their movements. One general has directions from these spirits to make special moves and is flattered with the hope of success. Another receives directions which differ widely from those given by the first. Sometimes those who follow the directions given obtain a victory, but more frequently they meet with defeat. According to this statement here, many generals, they have communication with evil spirits. And they, these evil spirits, they declare that they are the souls or spirits of deceased warriors. And they now say what moves they should take. Sometimes they gain... Sometimes they are defeated. And giving heed to evil spirits, they are obviously transgressing the first commandment, making or giving heed to another God. In Testaments for the Church, volume 1, page 364, it says, The great leading rebel, General, Satan, is acquainted with the transaction of this war, and he directs his angels to assume the form of dead generals, to imitate their manners, and exhibit their traits of character. Those who are engaged in the war, they are under the control of this great rebel, Satan, who leads all the movements of generals, and warriors, and uh, he says that they assume the form of the uh, deceased 
generals of the past, warriors. The first commandment is utterly and totally transgressed in the war. What about the second commandment? Thou, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. In volume 5, Testimonies for the Church, 173 and 174, we read, No outward shrine may be visible, there may be no image for the eye to rest upon, yet we may be practicing idolatry. It is as easy to make an idol of cherished ideas and objects as to fashion gods of wood or stone. Thousands have a false conception of God and his attributes. They are as verily serving a false god as were the servants of Baal. Are we worshipping the true God as he is revealed in his word and Christ in nature? Or are we adorning some philosophical idol enshrined in his place. And in Great Controversy, page 583, we read, In rejecting the truth, men reject its author. In trampling upon the law of God, they deny the authority of the lawgiver. It is as easy to make an idol of false doctrines and theories as to fashion an idol of wood or stone. By misrepresenting the attributes of God, Satan leads men to conceive of him in a false character. And in Testimonies to Ministers, page 39, we read this. He, Satan, is full of anger because he cannot bind the people of God in bundles with the world to render to him complete allegiance. Kings and rulers and governors have placed upon themselves the brand, brand of Antichrist and are represented as the dragon who goes to make war with the saints, with those who keep the commands of God and who have the faith of Jesus. Satan wants to make of these rulers supreme persons and look upon them as gods. And these are uh, human mortal beings. So the second commandment is transgressed uh, in the war. In the third commandment it is equally transgressed. When in the war we take the name of God in vain, asking God to give the victory, and maybe the other army, the other side, they also ask God to give them the victory, whose prayer will God hear? About the fourth commandment. We all know the fourth commandment is a commandment to keep the seventh day Sabbath holy. And the Sabbath cannot be kept in the war as we have read before. In Patriarchs and Prophets, page 307, we read, those who discuss business matters or lay plans on the Sabbath are regarded by God as though engaged in the actual transaction of business. To keep the Sabbath holy, we should not even allow our minds to dwell upon things of a worldly character. How could the fourth commandment be kept in the war? Our minds diverted completely from the war enterprise and turn to God. It is just impossible to serve God. As we mentioned before, 
no one of those that are assigned to combatant services like mechanics, cooks, electricians, engineers, whatever. When there is emergency on Sabbath, they could, cannot say, today is Sabbath, I'm not going to do it. Such thing is not tolerated in time of war. What about the fifth commandment? The fifth commandment requires respect to God and to parents. But uh, in the war, this is impossible to keep the fifth commandment because the war does not recognize age of persons to respect older people. Maybe one soldier is called to kill his own father or maybe his relative who may be in the opposite trench. The war equipment and the bombs, grenades, guns, they do not make any differentiation between older people and younger people. The fifth commandment is also transgressed in the war. What about the sixth commandment? This is directly transgressed in the war. Thou shalt not kill. But someone may say, oh yes, they go there to the war, but they will not kill. They will go there to save. The point is that the spirit of prophecy made it very clear that in the army we cannot obey God and the officers at the same time. It is a violation of every principle of their faith. In Testimonies for the Church, Volume 4, page 248, we read this. The teaching of our lives is wholly for or against the truth. If your works seem to justify the transgressor in his sin, if your influence makes light of breaking the commandments of God, then you are not only guilty yourself, but you are to a certain extent responsible for the consequent errors of others. What about the seventh commandment? Thou shalt not commit adultery. Patriarchs and Prophets 306 tells us the close and sacred relation of God and His people is represented under the figure of marriage. Idolatry being a spiritual adultery, the displeasure of God against it is fitly called jealousy. And great controversy, 382, the unfaithfulness of the church to Christ in permitting her confidence and affection to be turned from him and allowing the love of worldly thing to occupy the soul is likened to the violation of the marriage vow. In this testimony, it is clearly shown that those that have united with Christ and accepted Christ as their personal Savior, they are joined together. And you cannot serve Christ and another master. It's impossible to serve two masters. And what about the Eighth Commandment? Thou shalt not steal. Again, a very short statement 
from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 309. The Eighth Commandment condemns men stealing and slave dealing and forbids wars of conquest. It condemns theft and robbery, which is the war that has not in view conquest. Every war has in view conquest. And the spirit of prophecy here says that the Eighth Commandment forbids the war of conquest. What about the Ninth Commandment? Thou shalt not bear false witness. We read again, same page, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 309. We read what the Spirit of Prophecy says about transgression of the Ninth Commandment. False speaking in any matter, every attempt or purpose to deceive our neighbor is here included. An intention to deceive is what constitutes falsehood. By a glance of the eye, a motion of the hand, an expression of the countenance, a falsehood may be told as effectually as by words. All intentional overstatement, every hint or insinuation calculated to convey an erroneous or exaggerated impression, even the statement of facts in such a manner as to mislead is falsehood. This precept forbids every effort to injure our neighbor's reputation by misrepresentation or evil surmising, by slander or tail-bearing. Even the intentional suppression of truth by which injury may result to others is a violation of the ninth commandment. And the last, the tenth commandment, the same chapter, same book, and the same page, 309 Patriarchs and Prophets. The tenth commandment strikes at the very root of all sins, prohibiting the selfish desire from which springs the sinful act. Notice carefully that here the tenth commandment thou shalt not covet strikes the root of all sins and prohibits self-desire in desire of ages page 152 it says we should never give sanction to sin by our words or deeds our silence or our presence. Wherever we go, we are to carry Jesus with us and to reveal to others the preciousness of our Savior. And one statement from Great Controversy, page 624. The spirits of devils go forth to the kings of the earth and to the whole world to fasten them in the deception and urge them on to unite with Satan in his last struggle against the government of heaven. By these agencies, rulers and subjects will be alike deceived. Interesting that the Seventh-day Adventists from the very beginning they were opposed to war from the very beginning. And that is the historical position of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. However, lately there was a change made since World War I. And we will talk about that in some other presentation. However, in uh, 
Review and Herald, July 24th, 1941. This is what Seventh-day Adventists have declared. Review and Herald, July 24th, 1941. Refusing to be called conscientious objectors, Seventh-day Adventists desire to be known as conscientious cooperators. They are willing to provide stretcher bearers and medical men for army service, but they plead that they may be free from all combatant service. They refuse to be identified by conscientious objectors, and they prefer to be known as conscientious cooperators. Cooperation with whom and when? Listen carefully what I'm going to read, and this is a decision of the General Conference Committee of the Seventh-day Adventist Church made in the year 1951 and was published in the magazine Youth Instructor, April 10, 1951. And I uh, quote what is there. The General Conference Committee has recently adopted a plan that is of interest to all Seventh-day Adventist young men of military age everywhere. In adopting this plan, the members of the committee have been led by the conviction based on inspiration that we are rapidly approaching the day when the unrestrained anger of the nations will be upon us. For this reason, we have felt that all Adventist youth should be provided with a training in preparedness for that hour. It will be upon youth that will fall the great share of the military support of the nations. Youth must fight the world's battles. It will be largely young men who will be affected by the summons to beat their plowshares into swords, their pruning hooks into spears. Moreover, we are told that the final struggles of this world will be universal. No one nation or two or three will be singled, singled out from the others. The spirit of demons will go forth unto the kings of the whole world to gather them together unto the hour of the great day of God. Seventh-day Adventist youth, therefore, of all nations, will be called to play a leading role in the events of our world's closing hours. Youth Instructor, April 10, 1951, right on the front page. Some important points in this readings. The youth must fight the world's battles, it says here. Second point, that the final struggles of this world will be universal and no nation will be singled out. Spirit of demons will call the nation's representatives to that battle. And the very sad point is that they say that the Seventh-day Adventist youth, they have to play a leading role in the events of our world's closing hours. Brethren, the war of Armageddon will be called by evil spirits, as recorded in Revelation chapter 16. And when will be the war of the Armageddon? It will be after the close of probation. And after probation closes, God sends the seven last plagues to punish the inhabitants of the earth. 
And now what will the youth do in the Armageddon? One day a person told me, oh, we are not going there to kill. We are going to save. But save what? Save whom? Why is God sending the plagues to destroy? God will destroy the inhabitants of the earth by the plagues. And I said, and now many will go there to save those whom God is destroying. Therefore, we'll be acting against God. But whether one will be there as a stretcher bearer or as a combatant or as a medical, it doesn't matter. In any case, God's people will have no place in that last war. Where will God's people be? in the time of trouble. Volume 9, page 17. A statement that we read, but I wish to repeat. Fearful tests and trials await the people of God. The spirit of war is turning the nations from one end of the earth to the other. But in the midst of the time of trouble that is coming, a time of trouble such as has not been since there was a nation. God's chosen people will stand unmoved. And where will be God's people in the time of trouble? Great Controversy tells us on page 635. The people of God, some in prison cells, some in hidden in solitary retreats in the forests and the mountains still plead for divine protection, while in every quarter companies of armed men urged on by hosts of evil angels are preparing for the work of death. Where will be God's people in the time of trouble? Certainly no one in the valley of Megiddo. Certainly, no one taking part in that war in any capacity. But they will be scattered. Some in prison cells. Others in solitary retreats. In the forests. In caves. They are protected by holy angels. But none of them will be taking active part in the Armageddon. Many uh, people say, but we go and take part in the war just as medical. The uh, Bible gives us an example what uh, will be the result of those who go as a medical or as a combatant. Let's read in the Bible an experience when David returned from a war. In 1 Samuel chapter 30, verses 22 to 24. 1 Samuel 30, 22 to 24. Then answered all the wicked men, and men of Belial, of those that went with David, and said, Because they went not with us, we will not give them aught of the spoil that we have recovered, save to every man his wife and his children, that they may lead them away and depart. Then said David, Ye shall not do so, my brethren, with that which the Lord has given us, who has preserved us, and deliver the company that came against us into our hand. For who will hearken unto you in this matter? But as, as his part is that goeth down to the battle, 
so shall his part be the tarries by the stuff. They shall part alike. The reward given to a combatant or to a medical man is the same. And if the enemy take imprisoned, captive, one man in the army, he does not want to know whether he was medical or combatant. He only knows that he is enemy and will treat him as such. Therefore, brethren, when the commandments of God says, Thou shalt not kill, we have to choose whether we shall obey God or man. Surely, we should be always the best citizens obey every good laws of the land up to the point when the demands of men comes in collision with the demands of God. Then we have to choose like the apostles did. It is more expedient for us to obey God than to obey men. This should be our decision. Therefore we as Seventh-day Adventist Reform Movement came into existence exactly because of this point. Because our forefathers would not take part in the war. And we adopted until today the position of conscientious objectors. By conscience we are not permitted to take part in the war. And those that are faithful to the law of God, they will have to answer a question. And the only question that will be asked in Gospel Workers, page 315, is this. The only question asked in the judgment will be, have they been obedient to my commandments? And how does God consider when the law of the land is supreme, a law that conflicts with the law of God? I want to read in Testimonies to Ministers, pages 16 and 17. Consider, my brethren and sisters, that the Lord has a people, a chosen people, His church, to be His own, His own fortress, which He holds in a sin-stricken, revolted world. And He intended that no authority should be known in it, no laws be acknowledged by it, but His own. Satan has a large confederacy, his church. Christ calls them the synagogue of Satan because the members are the children of sin. The members of Satan's church have been constantly working to cast off the divine law and confuse the distinction between good and evil. Satan is working with great power in and through the children of disobedience to exalt treason and apostasy as truth and loyalty. And at this time, the power of his satanic inspiration is moving the living agencies to carry out the great rebellion against God that commenced in heaven. At this time, the church is to put on her beautiful garments, Christ our righteousness. There are clear, decided distinctions to be restored and exemplified to the world in holding aloft the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The beauty of holiness is to appear in its native luster, in contrast with the deformity and darkness of the disloyal, those who have revolted from the law of God. Thus, we acknowledge God and recognize His law, the foundation of His government in heaven, and throughout his earthly dominions. 
His authority should be kept distinct and plain before the world, and no laws are to be acknowledged that come in collision with the laws of Jehovah. If in defiance of God's arrangements, the world will be allowed to influence our decisions or our actions, the purpose of God is defeated. However specious the pretext, if the church waver here, let me emphasize, if the church wavers here, here where? In the obedience to the commandments of God. If the church waver here, there is written against her in the books of heaven a betrayal of the most sacred trusts and treachery to the kingdom of Christ. The church is firmly and decidedly to hold her principles before the whole heavenly universe and the kingdoms of the world. Steadfast fidelity in maintaining the honor and sacredness of the law of God will attract the notice and admiration of even the world. And many will, by the good works which they shall behold, be led to glorify our Heavenly Father. God's church is very precious in His sight. But this church is only precious in His sight while that church keeps the commandments of God at all times and under all circumstances. If the church waver here, that church became, becomes a traitor of the kingdom of Christ. Therefore, we should decide on which side to stay. On the side of the Lord, keeping all His commandments, or on the side of the great rebel. There are only two sides. There are only Christ and Satan. And it is up to us to decide on which side we will stand. May God help us that we may stand always on the side of God and His truth, defending His principles and His law under all circumstances and all times. This is my desire, in Jesus' name. Amen.